recording. Here we go. Who's on? We got a bunch of people. Okay, we're good. And do I have my video file working this time? Yes, I do. Okay. All right. Welcome, welcome, everybody, um, to the ninth or tenth session of the Back to the Saddle study course. Um, it's good to be back here again. Um, the purpose of this course is again uh, is uh, first to take a trip through the Getty and to point out things that we might not necessarily get to encounter when we're training on the south floor. Um, and uh, in doing so, to take a look at the Getty in preparation for our return to our collective cells this year, sometime this year, hopefully sooner than later. Um, I am the one who's been leading this course principally, so you will have received uh, my view of what's in the Getty and a lot of this analysis. Um, my view is merely one of many, and um, like uh, all instructors at Emma, I'm sure, uh, we uh, don't want you to believe something is so just because we said it. We want you to be convinced by the same evidence that we are convinced by. Having said that, um, let's uh, get into today's session. We actually made all the way through the dagger and sword section uh, last class, believe it or not, as well as finishing the dagger uh, section, uh, which was a pretty, it was a pretty crazy, crazy time last Monday. Um, does anybody have any questions from last session that they wanted to bring up but didn't get a chance to do so? No, okay, so I'll take this opportunity then to reiterate that if you do have questions or comments and things as we go through, please do um, speak up, type it in the chat or whatnot, um, so uh, we can get to them. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. Okay, let me clear the chest out of the way there. Everybody's good in Facebook? Okay, excellent. All right, so to <coughs> today we're actually starting the sword in Fiore, which is pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. We're starting the sword in one hand section. So um, this is awesome. Um, I've been waiting to get to this point. For me personally, the sword is my um, uh, my the, the passion of my interest, I guess. Particularly the sword in one hand. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm I'm glad we've made it here. We're going to get into some really interesting and fascinating things. Uh, in the upcoming uh, sessions. We'll have lots to talk about, and I'm very excited to do it. So, um, yeah, so just as a quick sort of refresher, because um, it's always good to feedback on the information that we've come through, uh, we began this uh, um, course by looking at the preface comments that Fiore makes um, to the whole manuscript as well as to the Abrazari section. Then we looked at, in turn, um, the Abrazari section, the Bastano Cello section, the Dagger section, and then the Dagger and Sword section. In total comprising um, or coming up to folio 20RA in the Getty. Um, the, sword in, uh, the Dagger and Sword section is the first time that we see swords um, in, the, in the manual. Um, though in the Dagger and Sword section, um, with respect to their use against the dagger man, we see the so um, we see the swordsman cutting and thrusting. We haven't had an explanation of what these are, of course, from Fiore, but we see them cutting and thrusting against the dagger man. Um, we also see the swords uh, the swordsman using their offhand as an elbow push, which is neat to see. Um, uh, yeah, it's just neat to see in general, and also reinforces that this elbow push concept that um, we're, we've seen in the dagger section over and over and over and then in the Abrazari section that this is going to come up uh, with a sword. And then when we see the a scholar or a remedy or a master with a sword in their hand, we see a very peculiar context or a very particular context. And that is that we see a sword in a sheath. And particularly a sheath that seems to be of a robust nature, <clears throat> so not a cloth sheath or something like that, or some some or with some you know malleable fabric 
uh, or a material, but one that is robust enough to be utilized not only to um, make defenses against the dagger, uh, but also to strike the uh, enemy with. And um, yeah, so and isn't that interesting? Um, and at the end of the session, we looked at um, this poster here, or we looked at this position, and I said, uh, we're going to see this come up again uh, very quickly, um, 20 RA, and sure enough, we're going to get to see it in the first Remedy Master, or the first uh, uh, Master, rather, of the sword, okay? Um, but um, thus far, we haven't really talked about swordsmanship that much yet in the, in the book. It's been mostly build up. So, um, so today we're going to start the sword in one hand section. Okay. Um, however, we're going to we're going to we're going to take a bit of a taster. We're going to look ahead a bit at the sword in two hand section in order to help us contextualize the sword in one hand section. Not uh, specifically for this course as well, because um, while I am intentionally trying to walk through this from beginning to end, um, there are some things that we've moved in a little bit out of order just to look at um, basic concepts and things like that. So, um, yeah, so, at f so first, let's just take a survey of the sword in one hand section, okay? The sword in one hand section, first of all, it starts off with a sword, um, <laughs> a sword in one hand. Okay, M more on that later. It starts off with a master, and then what follows is what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven scholars. And no counter master. Okay? Um, <clears throat> what the sword in one hand section doesn't have is it doesn't have a discussion of blows, it doesn't have a discussion of principles, um, nor does it have a discussion of posta. We just start right into it. Okay, and I want to underline this because this is conspicuously present in the sword and two hands section, um, which I believe comprises everything from folio 22 RA all the way down to the last play uh, to the, well, to 31 RAB here. Um, yeah, that's right. So this I would, um, call the sword in two hands section being defined principally as being used in swords in two hands um, and in this section we have a discussion of all of the cuts you see here we have a discussion of a whole bunch of posta right a whole bunch of posta slash guards and we have um, we have some prefatory comments and then we have a, a, a an exploration of the nature of swordsmanship in two discrete categories, Zogo Largo and, and uh, um, Zogo Stretto, okay? And so, you know, it, it isn't as organized as it looks, but it still seems, on the outset, it seems fairly, you know, uh, complete, right? Um, it seems like someone put some effort into kind of drawing a border around what, what they think swordsmanship in two hands entails. All right. So when I point this out to again um, emphasize that um, I'm going to move this page here that this isn't in the sword in one hand section, or rather all of this stuff, which seems to be seems like it it, it ought to be prior to our discussion of plays, that being posta and cuts. This stuff is prior in the sword and two hands section, but it isn't prior to this section, okay? So 
what this means is, is that um, in order to help ourselves understand what's going on here, we kind of have to look at both sections with, each, uh, with, with one eye each while we're reading this. All right? Um, we have to, uh, yeah, because what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with swordsmanship, right? And the plays of, uh, that a swordsman will uh, perform will follow from the principles of swordsmanship, right? And it will follow from the nature of the posta that the, a swordsman lies in. So if that's true, then um, we're going we're gonna to start the today's session. We're going to start by, you know, looking at the first master and moving on. But we'll, we'll likely frequently refer to the sword and two hand section, um, if not other things. Uh, other things, okay? Um, and lastly, I should note that, you know, though it appeals to our sensibilities to consider, you know, to consider what comes after something in a book, to be after it in time, you know, because, you know, you're reading it from, reading the book from beginning to end, right? Um, books are uh, sorts of technology, and I'm not saying this in a patronizing way, but books are the kind of technology that everything in the book is available to you as long as you flip to it. So just because the sword of two hands section and a lot of these prefatory comments and all of these interesting things about, the, about the, the guards and all the rest of it, just because this comes after the sword in one hand section doesn't necessarily mean it was in... Uh, you know, Fiore didn't think it was relevant, right? Or Fiore didn't think that it applied or, or whatever, right? Um, it is curious though, not least because as we've seen thus far in the manuscript, Fiore seems to have been very cognizant of the fact uh, that building up principles and, uh, uh, and premises uh, in the beginning can help inform our understanding of things to come, right? And the, uh, you know, the perfect example of this is the sword and uh, the, the dagger versus sword section because this section culminates every, you know everything we've seen about abrazare and about dagger and then adds a sword in so when we time we get here you know a, a dagger against a sword or a sword against a dagger in many ways this is a far journey from where we came from we came from just wrestling, Abazari on Abazari, no weapons, right? But now that we're here, what may have been an overwhelmingly complex situation for us if it was at the beginning of the book, now when we got here, we, we were very confident. All, you know, I don't want to say bored, but like, you know, we knew kind of exactly what we were hand, uh, dealing with here, right? We weren't in, we weren't in unfamiliar territory. Um, and all this is, is to say that when we start off in this, uh, with the sword in one hand here, now we're back in kind of unfamiliar territory. We haven't had the, the treatment of the nature of the sword in the way that Fiore has taken pains to do with Abrazari. Um, so isn't that interesting, okay? Um, as a very quick primer, before we start to get into the master, uh, the, the sword in one hand, Let's just review some super basic concepts for everyone here, okay? Um, the, uh, the sword has these cuts and attacks available to it. The fendente, the, or at least as far as Fiori um, articulates. The fendente, the sotani, the mezzani, and, the, and the, the thrust, okay? The fendente and the sotani have a discrete angle which is um, from teeth to knees. That's what Fiori defines it as, okay? From teeth to knees or from knees to teeth, which is on a clock from, you know, one o'clock to six o'clock and 11 o'clock to five o'clock, broadly speaking. Maybe even a little more discreet, maybe even a little more vertical. In class, I always tell students, to try and cut vertically, and they'll fail and cut a proper fendente. And when people try and um, you know try too much to get the angle, practically they end up cutting 
what um, is called in later uh, texts uh, something called a squalimbral, which is an angle of um, shoulder to hip. And that's interesting for us because in the Senyo page, which divides, more or less divides the book, page 30, uh, 32R, the Fendentes and the Sotanis are shown, <laughs> um, well, they're shown more at a squalimbro angle than they are Fendente. You can see that these angles do not, um, do not match. Okay? Um, the Mezzano don't match either in that the typical target of the Mezzano is rather high, but the Mezzano can be from shoulder to upper thigh. Okay? But the Mezzano is a horizontal um, uh, cut. Okay? And then finally we have the, the thrusts, and the thrusts can come in any hand position, though Fiore doesn't discuss the hand positions overtly. So th these are the attacks that we're um, that we're dealing with. These are not the only attacks that are possible with the sword, though they're the ones that Fiore um, confines himself to. Uh, you know, principally that, you know, or a perfect example of this is the squalimbro. The squalimbro is a is a perfectly reasonable angle of attack, but Fiore doesn't um, uh, doesn't um, directly articulate it. Okay. So these are the attacks that we're dealing with with um, uh, the sword. And the hand positions um, of the, or the, the positions of the hand, if you put your hand out in front of you, um, many different manuscripts actually use different parts of the hand to describe hand positions. Some use the palm, some use the, the fingernails, some use the position of the thumb. Um, and it's very interesting as to what arbitrary body part um, people use to uh, describe the hand positions. Um, but just for our purposes, I'm going to describe um, the thumb, okay? So, um, if you put your hand out in front of you, the four canonical hand positions are going to be when your thumb is at um, on a clock, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, uh, uh, sorry, 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 3 o'clock. Yeah, okay, so the four, the four, the four quadrants on a, on a clock, okay? Um, when your thumb is at six o'clock, then you're in first position. When your thumb is at nine o'clock, you're in uh, second position. When your thumb is at 12 o'clock, you're in third position. And when your thumb is at three o'clock, you're in fourth position. So one, two, three, four. Um, and those are the four um, classic hand positions. Uh, and by that I mean places that your hand can be in. Though, of course, a clock has many angles, and your hand can be, practically speaking, at any angle, right? Uh, obviously, if you can do it, you can do it. Um, but the four main hand positions are what we confine ourselves to typically when we fence. Um, and uh, the thrust can be done in, um, in any of the four hand positions, okay? So this, these are the cuts and attacks that we're dealing with. Um, the posta, so um, what's a posta? We're going to return to this later, but and, and we've already discussed it. So let's just reflect on, um, reflect on what we know already. So, so when uh, Fiore believes that a guard is, for lack of a better word, a place where you have options. You have options for attack and defense. Good options. Okay? So when you when you are in a guard, that guard, based on its characteristics, will have certain follow-on actions that are conducive to an attack and conducive to a defense. And depending on the guard you hold, it will depend on which follow-on actions are more immediate for you. And um, this will, well, many things will affect as to what guard you hold at what time, but um, what the guard is immediately good at and what the guard is immediately weak at in large part defines the nature 
of the guard and is a is in large part what you will um, what you will think about when deciding on which guards to adopt and which guards to change out of. Thus far, the only posta we've been holding, ironically, has been this posta, <laughs> has been uh, Porte di Ferro. All of the guards of the dagger were in Porte di Ferro, and the, um, well, I shouldn't say the only post we've been holding. Um, there are four guards of Abrazare, one of which is um, Posta di Ferro. We had Posta Longa, Borstooth, and Frontale as well. Um, but uh, that said, we haven't seen um, we haven't seen images of Fiore adopting um, adopting Longa, uh, Frontale, or Borstooth in preparation to receive an attack. Right? We haven't seen images of that yet. Whereas with the sword, we're going to start to see various different places where Fiore says, you know, you can adopt this posta and receive an attack, you know, in this posta. You can adopt this posta and receive an attack in this posta. And, you know, various sorts of things. Okay? <clears throat> but again, to summarize, a posta is a place where you have options, good options, for attack and defense. And while it's true that one can change from, one can move from posta to posta if one has trained very quickly. So adopting one posta does not prevent you from adopting another, even one of different natures, right? You can move from, from, from Baikono here to uh, Borstu in a, the blink of an eye, right? You can move from right tail to a brother on the left and a, the blink of an eye, right? So adopting one um, one posta does not exclude another posta, but each posta has its own nature and is con is more immediately conducive to some things than to other things. So when we're looking at swordsmanship, well, the first things we tend to do, well, first of all, before I get into that, what perspective on swordsmanship are we are we looking at seeing it with fury, right? That's a very important question for us to contextualize this, because it's important to know before we even start reading that swordsmanship is extremely complex, and there is so much, so much in it, and fury leaves out far far, far more than he puts in, okay? Or rather, there is far, far, far more to swordsmanship than merely what is expressed here. Why is this important to know? It's important to know this to contextualize our, or to set our expectations. Because we ought not, uh, we ought not approach this material, you know, the sword and two-hand stuff notwithstanding, we ought not approach this material expecting a thorough uh, treatment, right? On the contrary, we're going to see that we, sh you know, once we get into it, we're going to expect a treatment that is cursory, or at least seems to us cursory, and we're going to be grateful for any permanent universal comments that Fury. Uh, tries to make, right? And in the sword sections, when Fiore, you know, steps out of his, um, what, what he's going to do, and says things that, that seem like principles, that's when we really key in to the text. And that's when we say, okay, we've really got to pay attention here. Because now Fiore's addressing some principles directly, and we don't have to infer these things from the plays, okay? Because uh, inferring the, uh, a, a lot of the principles of swordsmanship are difficult to infer from the place if you don't know what you're doing. And the proof of, in the pudding for that is looking at all the various different interpretations of Fury's swordsmanship out, out in the world there. Um, circumstantially, the interpretations of the Abrazari and the dagger are far more homogenous, in my view, than are the interpretations of the swordsmanship. Um, and this is explained very simply by the, making the observations that I just made principally that swordsmanship is um, 
there's a lot going on with, with swordsmanship. There's a lot that you need to you need to have in order for it to go right, and it's very easy for it to go wrong. Whereas with the dagger and with grappling, in comparison, I think anyway, you're dealing with more blunt principles and sort of blunt facts. Um, where, you know, I, I think it's it's easier to come to an agreement with that. But anyway, so what we're looking at with Fury Swordsmanship, Fury is, um, except in a couple plays, Fury is um, principally going to discuss swordsmanship from the position of the patient agent. Okay? So in, in swordsmanship, when we discuss a swordsmanship, um, two concepts called time and tempo are going to be very critical. We may even end up discussing these today. But, um, in fact, we probably will. But um, when we're talking about two people, right, an attacker, defender, the words we tend to use are patient and agent, right? Patient or patient agent and, and agent. People usually leave out the agent and patient agent because you would not say that too much. It gets confusing. And so the words agent and patient are important because they signify the relationship in tempo between the two figures. The patient is the one that is going to receive the attack. And the agent is the one who is initiating the attack. Okay? Now, they may not stay patient and agent for, uh, for very long, right? Um, someone may begin as the patient agent. Or, I, I, I just broke my own rule. <laughs> someone might begin as the patient, make a defense, and then immediately become the agent in the resulting engagement, right? But um, we usually use the words patient and, and agent to describe uh, figures that we're, that we're looking at here. And Fiore is going to discuss swordsmanship from the perspective of the patient. So everything we're going to see, with the exception of a couple plays, um, is by and large presented as a uh, as a reaction to an agent who is presenting an attack, is giving an attack. Okay. So that's important context number one. Important context number two. We took a moment when we, when we began the dagger section. We took a careful moment to contextualize the nature of what was going on with the dagger section. Principally that we were not fencing. In the dagger section, we were looking at, as I argued, we were looking at cases of murder where one person was giving a solid attack to the other, right, the agent, was giving a solid attack to the patient with a view and intent to murder them. So in that sort of situation, um, what's classically known or understood as fencing doesn't occur because fencing has some back and forth to it, right? The classic nature of fencing has incumbent in it the idea that there's, you know, no one's force, forcing you to attack the other person. You can go forward, you can go back. You can go right, you can go left, right? Your intention might be to kill your enemy, but in the typical notion of fencing, there's nothing forcing you to you know, kill him and kill him now, as it were, right? In the dagger section, we were dealing with a different scenario where the murder needed to happen and the attacker wasn't in a position to you know, dance around, trick, provoke, cajole the defender. Okay? Um, in, with the sword, it's a bit different, right? Or rather, the sword, of course, can, in fact, be that same scenario, perfectly possible, right? But with the sword, we are also starting to look at different contexts, right? Specifically contexts where um, maybe both people have some time and space to actually use the sword, um, use the long weapon for something that it excels at. And what this long weapon helps one do, as opposed to the dagger, the long weapon allows you not only to injure the enemy, 
without getting uh, injured yourself, but it allows you to keep some kind of distance from the enemy, which allows you to um, the options of um, moving in a much freer way than you necessarily would be able to do with a dagger, okay? With the long weapon, you can defend and attack with a, a, a distance between you and your enemy that allows you to react to things that are unforeseen, right? And react and it, 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 that distance translates into time and it allows that distance allows you the time to react to things unforeseen with a reasonable expectation that you'll be able to react successfully okay and this is an important um, this is an important concept to remember because this is precisely what we lacked with the dagger right in the fifth remedy master, of dagger, the critical issue that we dealt with was that we were within distance against the dagger that we didn't have control over, and this was a this was a catastrophic problem, because and not only that, but the dagger person had control over us. So, what the hell are we supposed to do? Well, we can only do what we we can. So we either have to attack the arm or we have to try and defend the dagger. But the dagger could come very quickly and the dagger could come from an angle which we might not expect, right? We could be thinking it's gonna come fendente and it comes low mandrito. We could be thinking it comes low mandrito but it changes up halfway through. We don't know. This is a very difficult attack to defend, even if you know what you're doing. But with the sword, the sword has incumbent in it at least the opportunity for space that can allow you the time to deal with attacks that are unforeseen. And also to deal with them in a way that creates what we classically think of as fencing, that creates the, um, you know, the possibility of a back and forth. And also note that I'm saying possibility because fencing is just as brutal as this right in, in in principle it's just as brutal as this and it can become this at any moment right and this is one of the main misconceptions that new students have when they begin studying fencing they think uh and of course they don't know any better they think that it seems like something different it seems like it's you know we're, if we have two huge swords um you know how could this be abrazari you know how could this be dagger right little do they know that um, not only can it become that at any moment, but um, circumstantially, we're gonna see much of the attention that Fiore uh, takes towards the sword is actually gonna be Albrazare plays, <laughs> or it's gonna be entries, which is very telling in and of itself. Um, but anyways, so um, what we're looking at with the sword, right? We're looking at a long weapon that has incumbent in it the opportunity to um, kill our enemy and make our defenses uh, preserving a distance between us that allows us the opportunity to react to things unforeseen. And it's this opportunity to react and the training that comes along with it that makes fencing, um, that, that allows a fencing master to be a master, right? There are no real fencing masters in the dagger, right? There's just two human beings trying to murder each other, right? The dagger is, an, is, a, is a situation that no matter your mastery, the unarmed person is in massive, massive trouble, right? And they may survive, but the circumstances are heavily, heavily weighted against them. Fencing is different in that if this space is preserved, if this time is preserved, then the skill and training of a fencing master is able to be deployed. And, that, and the skill and training of that fencing master is able to shine through, such that the fencing master is not at the same catastrophic risk of injury and death that these poor uh, SOPs are, right? We have much more control, at least we have the possibility 
of having much more control over this martial situation when we're dealing with swordsmanship than we do with something like dagger or even abrazari. Okay? Um, so, yeah. So, um, okay, what else, what else should I say here? Um, okay, so another thing to um, remind ourselves of when we're looking at the sword in one hand section is why we call it the sword in one hand section. We don't, excuse me, call it the arming sword section. Um, though um, the astute of you or the, or the, <laughs> the, old, the, the old among you may remember that Emma actually um, began uh, training with arming swords way back in the day. My first, actually, I think when I, when I just when I started Emma, um, the curriculum, the recruit curriculum was making a formal transition towards being long sword focused. But we began actually studying with army swords. And um, I wasn't actually there at the time, so I don't know what thought process um, went, went through everybody's minds. But um, the swords, uh, that w as we've learned since then, the swords that we're dealing with here uh, are long swords. They're not army swords. Though, of course, one could reasonably take this sword in one hand material and use an army sword with it, no problem. Right? Um, but all this is to say that the sword in the sword in two hands section is the same sword in this section. Okay? So we ought not make the same uh, make the mistake of thinking that it's different. Um, now, why is this important to bring up? Well, those of you who own a, a good steel sword will will know that um, you know, though, especially those who, who own a sharp sword, the, the the two these long swords they're they're not that heavy, right? They're still pretty light. You can be pretty deft with them. So, though there is a difference um, b between the sword in one hand, like a classic arming sword and a long sword, the difference is in the difference in dexterity and in, in, in um, uh, deftness is not extreme. And with training, um, you ought not feel like the long sword encumbers you in an extra significant way um, than uh, than it would if it was an arming sword. Um, those of you who I've ever watched the movie Thirteenth Warrior. You may remember the scene where um, uh, one of the Vikings throws Antonio Banderas a sword, and Antonio Banderas says the sword's too heavy, and the Vikings re re reply is grow stronger. <laughs> so if you're ever doing sword in one hand stuff with your long sword and you feel like the long sword's too heavy, just think of that Viking in your head saying grow stronger in a very sassy sort of Viking way. Um, and yeah, so um, all of, so there's nothing that a long sword is going to prevent us from doing uh, in a classic uh, army sword sense, right? All these actions can be done with the army sword. Everything the army sword can do, the long sword can do. So um, so fine, okay. And in the sword one hand section, we are using a army sword. Or, uh, so excuse me, we're using a long sword in one hand. Okay, so that's the weapon we're dealing with. Um, I kind of broadly glossed over the context of what we're dealing with. Um, you know, there's a lot more principles at play here. Um, I glossed over time and tempo, but I didn't really talk about them too much. We'll, we'll probably end up talking about them shortly, but I'll leave it till that naturally comes up. Um, we talked about the cuts, we talked about the posters. Does anybody have any questions so far? Did I say anything that was super confusing? I may have overcomplicated something, or seemed like I did. No? Okay. Um, I guess that's a good sign then. <laughs> um, all right. So, so let's get into it. Okay. Let's look at the first master of the sword in one hand, folio 20RC to 20RD. Okay. Um, can we have Alex read the text for us, please? 
We three opponents want to kill this master, one with a thrust, one with a cut, and the other by throwing his sword. It will be a miracle if we don't kill this master. God damn him. You're all two-bit poltroons and know little of this art. Enough with talk, we'll see some action. Go ahead and come on one by one, if you know what you're doing. Even if there were a hundred of you, I'd still mess you all up with this guard, which is so good and strong. I'll perform an acrescimento, slightly offline with my front foot, and I will pass a bleeding with my left foot. As I pass, I'll cross and beat away your swords. Find your open and strike you for sure. Go on and throw a sword or spear at me, and I'll beat them away as I've described. Passing at an angle, as you will see from my plays, which come just ahead. Please look at them. And even with the same sword in one hand, I can practice my art, as you'll find in this book. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, lots of sass in there. But also, we actually get some... Um, we get some specific um, specific actions. So what's going on here? Um, we have these three figures. Uh, one with a thrust, one with a cut, and one who's throwing their sword. Okay? Um, typical interpretation of this. Uh, these three figures um, reads them as anthropomorphizing what this swordsman could be faced with. Right there, you know, he could be faced with cuts, he could be faced with thrusts, or someone could throw their sword at the guy, right? Which is kind of an, in, in concept, it's kind of a thrust, but um, theory separated out here so far. Okay, so this seems pretty self explanatory, I think. These are the three kinds of, of things that the swordsman can, can deal with. What's the swordsman doing? So here's the, here's the master now. Um, I did say, I kind of um, foreshadowed that the organization of the Getty is going to get a little wonky when we get to the sword, particularly with respect to um, how masters and scholars and countermasters start to appear. In the sword in one hand section, we're still okay. Where from this master, all the scholars are going to follow from the from the action of the master okay or at least they're going to follow from um, what could reasonably construed uh, what could reasonably be construed as the action of the master okay and so um, we're gonna we're gonna see that right we're gonna see that but broadly speaking um, these guys follow that rule okay so that's just something to, to know. Now, um, the master, what are they doing? So the master is resting in this posta. Although, does he call it a posta? Um, he says guard, guard, uh, blah, 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 blah. guardia. Okay, he says guardia. This quest of guardia. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, so he's holding in this guard, and um, he's saying, "Come at me! I can, I can defend um, all uh, all of what you have." Okay, I can defend a cut, I can defend a thrust, or I can defend a thrown sword. So, um, so fine. He's resting this guard. What is this guard? Okay, this guard is called left tail. Okay. But the guard that he's displaying here is not just left tail, it's left tail refused. Okay, so let's um, have a bit, uh, a little discussion about posters uh, or guards. So, we don't see left tail um, in the sword and two hands section. Um, principally because it would cross your hands. We do see tail on the right here, okay? Um, but uh, what we see here in these three figures, these four figures, we see postas that are unrefused. So a refused, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a refused position 
is when the weight of your position is not 60-40 in favor of the front foot, where 60-40 would constitute an, an aggressive position. It's an aggressive body po uh, position. Rather, a refused position is where the weight is shifted 60-40 in favor of your back foot. Presum assuming that your face is facing the enemy. So in this case, here we have a figure, Folio 23 VD. The, po the position is refused from the enemy that the scholar is looking at, uh, from the, the post is looking at. Whereas posta longa here is not refused towards the enemy that they're looking at. Okay. So why is this significant? Well, it's important to understand that in oh, that a refused position is a provocative position. Okay, and we'll talk about provocations later. We're not, I won't burden you with that in, in this class. But suffice to say that when you adopt a refused posta, what you are doing is you are opening. You are you seem to be to the enemy opening lines of attack and offering lines of attack that your enemy may in fact choose. And you're doing that with the express purpose that they take your offer. In this position, Fiore is saying, I'm adopting a posta and I'm offering you my whole right side. Please attack me where I am most open. But Fiore also knows that the post he's adopting is perfect for covering attacks made to any of those targets. So he could adopt this position and not be refused, but if Fiore is fighting someone who he thinks is going to come after him, then it makes sense to adopt a refused position. You can't really uh, um, be the, you, uh, refused positions are not really for agents. Refused positions are not conducive to attacking, pressing the measure. But refused positions are conducive to uh, a situation where you find yourself as the likely patient to, to an attack. Okay? And in this scenario, uh, in this uh, sword in one hand section, we are going to understand the beginning of this engagement to be where the context is the um, the scholar here, the person receiving the attack, the patient is uh, is, is is the patient agent, right? They're being uh, aggressed uh, towards by the, uh, the the enemy. Okay, so um, this guy's refused, right? He's in a, he's in a refused posta and he's adopting a position called left tail. Okay. Um, Every posta, um, well, you know, every post that you adopt has your hand on the sword, right? Anytime your hand's on your sword, your hand is formally in one of the major hand positions that we talked about earlier. First, second, third, fourth, right? Prime, second, third, fourth. Um, in this posta, Fiori's hand is thumb down. So his hand is in what we would call prime. And circumstantially, the, um, the most conducive action here, the most obvious thing that the hand can do is to move in the hand position it's already adopted, right? And this is something that I told you what we would see shortly when we looked at the sword in, uh, when we looked at the sword and armor. Because, I mean, so the sword and armor, I apologize, the, the, the sword and dagger. Because coming up to a prime position is precisely what happens in folio 20RA. So in this folio, uh, Fiore's um, hand is, um, well, maybe it's not in, in, in prime on the sword, but his, his sword comes up into a position that um, it, it would also come up if you just raised your sword in the first Remedy Master. 
here, right? It's thumb down, it's at his hip. If he just raised the sword straight up, then his sword would be in this position we see here, right? This position, this position, uh, this position, okay? So this is important to note because we've seen this position before, okay? That's um, uh, a data point to remember. So um, looking at this posta, before we look at any of the plays, we should take a moment to consider what the nature of the posta is, right? And the nature of this posta seems to be that one of the, um, well, the most obvious follow-on of this posta here is for the sword to come up in prime ending in a posta that um, looks similar to uh, Fenestra, right? Don't think about that too hard because it's not really that. It's more like, uh, well, anyways, I don't want to get into it too much. The sword section is also going to be a bit difficult to describe on the internet. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to do my very, very best to not be confusing, but you have to bear with me. Uh, but yeah, so this the most obvious follow-on action for this sword uh, for the, in this poster is to have the sword come up in prime and engage the enemy in prime um, with the true edge of the sword facing up and the false edge facing down. And we didn't even talk about true edge and false edge. Broadly speaking, if you can grab a, a grab a ruler or any object in front of you, the true edge of the object is said to be the object where the edge. Um, faces the enemy and the false edge of the object is going to be the edge that faces you okay so in this case of um, this defense this poster if this hand were to come straight up the true edge of the sword is the sword that's going to is the edge that's going to lead this action okay this edge right here it's going to come straight up and in and cross the center line and boom come up so without having looked at any plays, just looking at the posta, or the guard that the uh, Fiori adopts, we should expect a transition to prime uh, to be one of the main things, okay? The other thing that we should expect is to have the sword come to the hip on the opposite side. So um, right now, Fiori's hands are already in Porta di Ferro. His sword is in left tail, but we know of, because we know our basic swordsmanship, we know of a posta um, that we see later in the, in the manuscript called Posta Breve. But this is a point forward guard um, held roughly, um, where, the, where the hand is held roughly akin to your one of your hips, aligned with your hips, and the, the, the blade of the sword angles inwards and guards half of your inside on the same side or so. Um, and we also know um, this posta frontale, which is, base, which is pretty much the cousin of Breve. It's just held at the shoulder. So when you're in left tail, a transition to the right hip or the right shoulder is just as easy as the transition of prime. And circumstantially, in this posta, the swordsman cannot attack you on your left side. Your left side is completely hidden. And not only that, but it's where the sword is. So to understand this section, we have to understand first that what the patient has done here is they have, they have made it almost impossible that they're going to receive an attack on the left side of the body. And they've adopted a posta that can cover literally every possible angle. There is no place this guy can attack that this sword can't cover and cover well. So you're all inept and you know little of this art. Enough with talk. Let's see some action. Get the fuck over with it already. I can deal with you. Give me what you got. That's what Fury says. What I've explained is what Fury means. He 
He's in a poster that has a very natural and strong reaction to any possible thing that, that you could logically bring before him. And he's provoking you to attack the targets that um, will uh, bring up those very easy covers. Okay? So right from the get-go, this is what we should be expecting to see. Now further, he talks a bit, a bit about footwork. He says, I'll step with my front foot a little off the line. His front foot being his right foot. Okay? And with his left foot, he'll pass at an angle. And as he does so, he'll cross and beat away your swords, find you open, and strike you for sure. Go ahead and throw a sword or a spear at me. He doesn't care. He's passing off the line. He'll be fine. Have a look at my plays. I know my art. Yada, yada. Okay, so um, we're going to keep in mind that little pass, uh, the passing step, or the little increase, and the little pa and the passing step. We're going to keep them in mind when we look at the plays that follow. Um, and the last thing to say is that there is currently a discussion, a scholarly discussion, as to what Fiore means when he says pass offline. Because with this front foot, to, um, to increase off the line, we know he says that, no question. But it's not obvious whether he means to increase off the line to the left or to increase off the line to the right. And both have really interesting things that, well, both result in really interesting things. And over the years, there's been a very healthy discussion as to which one people favor more at Emma. Um, I certainly learned, um, much of my time at Emma, I learned with the increase to the left. But over the last number of years, I've fallen in with the camp that believes it's actually an increase off the line into, well, to the right side, which actually sets up the actions um, arguably even, even better. So the point to, to, to note there is that there is a bit of a discussion as to whether or not the, the increase in all the follow-ons is to the, uh, the, the left or the right, but everybody is clear that the, uh, f uh, the pa a passing step follow-on is incumbent in this position. So um, for much of the follow-ons where we should expect to see, what we should expect is broad strokes the following. The attack will occur, Fury will engage the sword of the enemy with an increasing step off off the line so not not straight on the line where he is but just a little bit off the line and then after the engagement he will pass in with his left foot to achieve you know something else uh, to achieve a wrestling position to achieve a strike to achieve something okay and so this is the broad formula that we should expect to see just having looked at this play and this text. Okay, any questions so far? No? Okay, great. All right, let's move to the first scholar. Okay, 20 VA. Uh, Andrew, would you like to read the text for us? Andrew, if you're talking, you're muted. Oh, there it is. Okay. I followed to the letter what my master said. I've passed at an angle, making a good parry, thereby finding the opponent open. Now I can place a thrust to his face without trouble, and I want to see if I can also use my left hand to make his sword go to the ground. Okay. So, now we're actually getting into it. Now we're getting into swordsmanship. And, um, you know, I think we're just going to launch into this stuff, and I'm just going to do my best to explain. We will take a bit of a step back in the sword and two hands section when we're looking at the posters. We will be able to talk about, you know, 
some principles a little slower. So for those of you who, who find the resulting discussion a little uh, fast or over complex, just suffice yourselves that um, when we get to the sword two hand section in the posters, the posters, we're gonna take a step back and look more at, at principles. Um, yeah, or look at them at least in a, in, a, in a slower way. But now we're actually looking at Fetzer. So what the hell happened here, okay? How did we get here? So, <laughs> let's see if I can express this uh, efficiently. Critical to understanding fencing is to learn how to fence in the context where your opponent has a care for their own life. And then never fence with that expectation. <laughs> never actually fence with that expectation. So in order to understand how fencing is supposed to work and how things, how some things follow from other things, there is a, a general minimum uh, assumption that needs to be made. And that is that the opponent doesn't want to die. If the opponent doesn't want to or wants to die, is not is not interested in their own life, then the nature of your engagement with the sword is going to be um, it's going to be very it's going to be it's going to be different. It's going to be different. You're going to make a lot of um, different choices. The situation that you're dealing with will you know is 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 um, um, it's more akin to the dagger. Than, um, th than it is um, to um, fencing with somebody who's care for their own life. If you fence with someone who has to care for their own life, what this means is, is that by threatening something, you can cause a reasonable reaction to it. Okay? And by, th by threatening something, and by causing a reaction, you can therefore build tempo that can result in a hit or a successful defense okay now I guess we've got to talk about tempo the difference between time and tempo is this very simply time is a discrete measurement like 1.2 seconds any action can be measured with a discrete can be given a discrete time measurement okay any action, the, the flick of a finger, the shift of a, of a, a body motion, um, you know, the whole motion of a, of a sword cut from start to finish, you know, any part of it, any of that can be given a discrete time measurement, right? Tempo is the relationship between two times. So if I do something that has a discrete time measurement and you do something that has a discrete time measurement, as soon as we're engaged, then we have something that can be described by tempo. Okay? Um, so keep that in your minds here. Okay? So um, as a defender, the best thing the def a defender can do is to attack and defend in the same action such that if the attacker gives you a committed attack your defense not only stops you from being hit but also in the same moment kills the enemy an action that does that is referred to as a single tempo action Um, a, a colloquially at MO it's referred to a single time action but that's when the word time and tempo are being used to mean, to mean the same thing the other problem with the, with the terms time and tempo is that they're, they're used interchangeably often so it gets very very confusing okay? but as long as we hold on to the concepts behind the words then it doesn't matter really if we use them interchangeably but anyways so a single tempo action is when your attack and defense occur in the same moment as the same action and so you defend and kill with the same uh, with the same action okay 
So um, as the um, as the defender, as the patient um, in swordsmanship, uh, actions that are single tempo are um, they're sort of the heart and soul of the art. Um, Vadi calls them the jewel of the art, and they're things that um, uh, s- s- swords a swordsman are looking to do at all times. Pulling off a single tempo action could not be sweeter. It's the essence of swordsmanship. Okay. Um, but there's a difference between pulling off a single tempo action and threatening one. Okay. Between two masters against the best, no one's going to let you get away with a single tempo action. Right? No one's going to give you a committed attack and let you move from a, a guard to a conducive defense, single time kill you. Right? It's just not going to happen. Not least because the attacker is never going to attack without anticipating some kind of response. So, how did this how did this result here? Okay. Here's one explanation. What happened here is this guy, the attacker, the agent, gave a cut, fendente, um, uh, a fendente cut, and attempted to hit the opponent who was refused. What the opponent did here was the opponent did a little volta stabile and shifted to cut at the sword, make a defense in prime. So where true edge is up. They shifted to make a defense in prime and they projected their posta, which isn't really what's drawn, but they projected their posta such that if the attacker did not modify their blow at all, then this cut would cross the sword make the defense, and he would get a stab right in the face. Boom. Okay? So that's, oh, excuse me, so that is what this, um, that is the single time remedy against the Fendente that this, uh, adopting this posta allows you to do. Now the attacker Sorry, is, Aaron, Aaron, yep, can, please. Can you, to, mm-hmm. can you go into a bit more detail about the what the defender does actually? Right, okay, so so um, let's say the attacker is giving a fendente to the defender. So he's, he's um, attempted to hit him in the head, okay? Or in the on the right shoulder, say. Uh, the, yeah, on, on the shoulder. What the defender is going to do, what the patient is going to do, is he's going to just shift his position with a volta stabile. So he's not changing his footedness, but he's shifting his position, maybe adding a little increase, like he says in the text, and he's bringing his hand up in prime position. So it's going to engage the cut in prime position, which is more or less what this looks like. So as the cut came down, the defender's sword came up and it, um, and it touched the sword in a way that kind of looks like this. Now actually, just for extra clarity, this play here, is shown after the defender has passed in with his left foot. So you have to understand that this play, on the moment of the engagement, that this left foot of the defenders is back here, right? Because we're starting in this post. So here's the left foot, here's the right foot. Okay, I should use this. Um, Excuse me while I make everyone dizzy. I have a lot of tabs open. Okay, <laughs> so the defender is s- s- sitting in this posta here, in this guard. He does a volta stabile with a little increase, and he brings his hand straight up to prime position, and he th- threatens, he attempts a single time cover. Okay, he attempts to kill the attacker instantly, who's giving him a fendente. Does that explain? Where we are so far? Um, like you're. The reason I'm confused because I remember some of the two-handed sword attacks, like uh, uh, where a cut would both deflect and yes. also serve as the attack. But here, like you just said, you make the defense basically, and then you have to step in and like and and, and attack and like the actual cut that the sword motion that you do initially yeah. doesn't actually threaten them immediately. 
Well, okay, so, um, yeah, let me try and explain again. So, in this case, this play is following on from the initial action, okay? And so what I'm, what I'm about to describe, or what I, what I began to describe here, is I began to describe what caused this to take place, okay? And in short, what caused this to take place was the defender, was the patient, attempting a single-time remedy to the attack, and the attacker, having a care for their own life, having to modify their attack to prevent the single-time remedy success. Okay, so that's why this has happened. The attacker's gone to give a, uh, a solid fendente to the defender. The defender's attempted a single time remedy, a single temple remedy, where if the attacker did nothing else, they would die. And so what the attackers had to do is they've had to modify their attack. They've had to modify something about what they did to prevent themselves from being killed. Okay? So in this case, what did they do to, to prevent themselves from being killed, right? What was the modification? Well, if you'll remember, this sword came from the left side, okay? The sword came from the left side, moving low left to high right, and it was engaging a fendente. So one, uh, um, yeah, it was engaging fendente. If the attacker had not changed anything about the geometry of the engagement, the defender would have achieved an oblique deflection on the attacker, okay? Where the attacker's sword would have deflected just a little bit off to the um, defender's right side, where the defender's sword, uh, the uh, patient's sword would have been uh, unmoved in the center and he would have thrust the guy right in the face. In order to prevent oblique deflections, a standard and easy response for the attacker, and it's not a bad one either, it's just what you an easy thing to do, is to turn your true edge into the edge of the enemy. An oblique deflection is when the edges meet, uh, is when the edges of two swords meet at a fairly a steep and oblique angle, hence the name, where the edges don't really catch each other. Okay, one sword is deflected a little bit off to the side, and the other one is stays uh, stays on its original trajectory. If the true edge is turned into the true edge of the other, if the attacker turns his true edge into the true edge of the defender, that deflection will not occur. Instead, the edges will bind. Okay. So what's happened here is the attackers attempted a basic attack, a fendente. The defender has attempted a single tempo remedy to the attack. And the attacker, in response to this, at the last moment, turned the edge of his sword into the, def the, 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 uh, the response from the, from the defender to prevent the oblique deflection. And when this happened, the swords bound, edge on edge, such that the deflection did, uh, the deflection did, did not occur. The thing is, because this sword is coming from the low left, the blow is coming from the left. Okay, so the attacker needs to turn his true edge towards the blow. And what happens when he does this is he opens a little space in the center so that the defender can put their hand in there. When the attacker turns his true edge against the, to, to, to defend the, the blow, they create a bit of a triangle in the, in the uh, position. So if we were looking at this position, uh, if we were in parallel to these guys, not perpendicular, the engagement would be in the center, uh, on the center line between these two figures, and this guy's hand, the attacker's hand, would be a little bit out to their right side, 
almost uh, in, uh, in some kind of second position. They might even turn their hand into uh, uh, a second position, okay? Second hand position to, to prevent the deflection, okay? And what this does is it, pro it allows the defender a straight shot with a post longa and a passing step to reach in with a first remedy master cover against the inside of their sword hand, okay? And let's all remember that we know the first remedy master very well. This cover is, at least in, as depicted in this uh, image, this cover is in prime, right? The left hand is in prime, the thumb down. So in this situation, the cover is in prime, thumb down, okay? So the full story is this. This is the first action, the first scholar of the sword in one hand section. The scholar has received a fendente from the enemy. The scholar has attempted a single time remedy, which if it was not responded to by the, uh, by the, the agent, uh, the agent would have died. In attempting the single time remedy, which is a cut to prime, post a longa in prime, the attacker in order to stop this, turned their hand, roughly speaking, to second position turned the true edge of their sword to, uh, towards the direction of the attack, which in this case was from the scholar's left, and bound the edges of the sword. When the edges bound, that prevented the single-time remedy from occurring. But it did two critical things. One, it gave the scholar the tempo now. And two, it gave the scholar a fall. And I hope you guys see what happened here. The, the tempo of this engagement began, as it often does, with the agent giving the attack first and the patient responding to the attack. But good defenses create a situation where the patient then gains the tempo lead. And after the defense, the person who used to be the agent is now following the defender, not leading, okay? And this is what we see in this defense. Once the defense is made, the patient immediately enters in with a passing step and enters in with a grapple onto the sword hand of the enemy. And um, not only can he thrust to the enemy's face, but he might also be able to grapple the sword in some way, okay? So, um, yeah, so th this is what's happened here, okay? A an attempt at a single time remedy, which when foiled by the defender, uh, provided a um, very shallow entry onto the sword hand from the patient agent and which set him up for a great thrust and also um, from, for some other things. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Have I painted a picture of that in everybody's mind? Yep, thank you. Awesome, okay. Um, the, I will admit this is actually more difficult than I thought. Uh, I was having nightmares of, uh, 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 for months when COVID hit, I was having nightmares of describing sword actions on, on the internet. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, various wise people said, no, no, I'm sure you can do it. It'll be fine. And, uh, you know, and, and lately I was feeling confident, but um, yeah, anyway. Uh, okay, cool. Aaron. So, mm, yes, Bruce. Aaron. Mm. Just a comment. What, you, what you've just described mm -hmm. is not a, single, not a single move, but the culmination of three teaching points. So first of all, there's the you know, mm -hmm. defend against a fendente by knocking it aside and single thrust. Mm -hmm. Then defend against the fendente, you attempt a single thrust, he counters. Mm -hmm. Then you take his, his fendente, you defend, 
he counters, you counter. So it's a sequence that has been built up within this single yes. movement. Uh, yeah. Three exercises. That's uh, that's right. And, you know, like I said at the beginning, there's a lot involved in swordsmanship. And, you know, uh, um, there is, as you said, there are three, there are three uh, things that have gone on here to get us here. Three basic broad categories of things. A main attack, a response uh, from the, uh, a main attack from the agent, a response by the patient, a response to that response from the agent, and then a fourth action, a response to that from the patient. So yes, that is correct. And uh, once, once the agent responds, they're no longer the agent in this case, right? The agent in this case loses the tempo lead immediately when the um, when the patient gives the attempts the single time remedy, okay? And so, the reason why I took uh, I tried to take care to explain the sequence of events is that this is the kind of rational organization. This is the kind of action counteraction. I lead, you lead, that we all need to aspire to in fencing, both in our own understanding and in the way that we approach our enemy. Because this kind of organization in fencing is possible, and it doesn't depend on your enemy acknowledging it either, right? This is all about you. Viewing this thing is all about you. But having this kind of organization and understanding of the necessity of things makes you a good fencer. And it helps you do things that you should and avoid things that you shouldn't. And it's when you don't have an understanding of the tempo of an engagement and who's leading, who's following, what's at risk, that's when you make decisions uh, and um, misunderstand. Uh, you make decisions that you shouldn't and you misunderstand engagements that you that, that, that you should understand. So um, it's important that we analyze these sorts of actions with this language. Um, and, you know, admittedly, it's better if we can pair this language with action on the floor, but, um, you know, COVID and, and, and such. Okay, so um, let's try the next one. Okay, let's try the next one. There's 20 VA. Second scholar, 20 VB. Okay, Oof, this is another, um, this is another big one. All right. Um, uh, BD, would you like to read the text for us? Yes. I found you completely open and hit you in the head with no trouble. And if I pass forward with my rear foot, I can perform some close plays against you, like binds, breaks, and grapples. Wow, okay. So this is a big, this is a big play in my book. And to contextualize it, we need to look back at the whole list. So, um, so here we go, looking at all of the plays of the sword in one hand. We have one entry, no entry, one entry, one entry, 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 entry no entry. Okay, so in this presentation of the sword in one hand, of all the plays that Fiore shows, only one of them, maybe this one, I'm not convinced. Only, I'm going to say only one of them because it makes it sound more dramatic. Only one of them is a clear example of a defense and a counterattack with the sword that looks like fencing at Giacolo Largo, that looks like fencing at the tip of the sword with the sword as it's meant, as it's, you know, uh, uh, in the place that it naturally excels. 
right? So any of you who have watched, you know, who think of fighting with a sword, right? Only one play in this whole sword in one hand section, this one, gives an example of a, def of a deflection and a hit. Okay? None of the other plays do that. All the other plays are some kind of entry of some kind. Except for this one, but um, we'll leave that for the last. Okay. The only other thing that you could that you could say about this is um, uh, the for those who understand um, the 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 remedy master has incumbent in it uh, plays like this, right? Um, but that that of course is inferring our from our understanding. So um, even if we don't make a big deal about this, this play is significant. So um, let me say what is this play, and then let me try to make a big deal about it. So strictly speaking, this play is a, simply a very canonical deflection and counterattack. So in this case, the scholar has attempted a fendente against the, um, or the, 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 the agent has attempted a fendente against the patient, and the patient has responded in the exact same way as um, does the previous play. Although, of course, to get this situation, he could have responded in a, in a few different ways. But that's not important. What's important is what he got. And what he got is he got an oblique deflection. So what did he do? Well, having got the oblique deflection, he does not proceed to stab him in the face. Rather, he proceeds to turn his sword over and cut him with the true edge instead. Why? Why not? Is it a little slower than stabbing in the face? Sure. Is it still fine if he's unarmored? Yeah. Probably. Okay? So, um, and, and with a little step off line and whatever, um, in many ways this is a very sort of boring, standard, deflect and counterplay that you would expect to see in swordsmanship. Does anybody have any questions about that so far? No? Okay. So now let me make a big deal about it. I think this play is a super big deal because I think this play is the only window into the... into what is reasonably described as the heart of swordsmanship with the sword in one hand. The sword in one hand, as opposed to the sword in two hands, the sword in one hand is a very free, mobile, and vigorous weapon set. The offhand is available for entries at any time, but, uh, and because the sword is carried in one hand without a complex hilt, the sword arm must, when it's in the center, be constantly moving in order to um, avoid the near occasion of hand snipes and debilitating injury to the hand. The sword in one hand, by nature, is a very mutable um, a, a, a weapon set in ways that the sword in two hands isn't and doesn't have to be, even with the same hilt. So there is an entire universe of different parries and counters and strategies of which this single play is the only example of. Fiore says nothing about the rest of what's in here. We could read some of the stuff in the mountain section to um, also be f for the windows, and, and I'm kind of being a little a melodramatic, but I'm trying to make a point here, is that, you know, just because Fiore doesn't add a whole bunch of plays in the Seventh Remedy Master Dagger doesn't mean that there's nothing in the Seventh Remedy Master, we know this. Just because Fiore doesn't go on and on at length about the nature of the sword in one hand in Jacques Largo, in the wide play, doesn't mean that he doesn't 
know of a lot of moves doesn't mean there's not a lot there, okay? So we know independently that there's an absolute world of plays that are various different kinds of deflections and attacks. But what we do know, uh, or what, what we can see from Fiore's book, is that he only really talks about one of them. So I think it's reasonable to say, to take this play as sufficient evidence, as if we needed it, but for the skeptics, sufficient evidence that we know that Fiore know, knows about these kinds of actions. And it's left for us to research, experiment, understand and learn about the nature of the sword in one hand and all the things it can do at this um, in this Largo space. Okay? So I think this is a really big play. Uh, not least because there's tons of, you know, there's tons of things to train and understand about tempo and about how the swords react to each other at Largo and how little things are big things and there's so much to know about how swords react in Largo that would be in play here and that we would that we train here in the South. But, unfortunately, oh, what, for whatever reason, Fiore only talks about this deflect and attack uh, play the one time in the, whole, uh, in the whole section. Okay? So, the rest of the plays are various analogs of the entries that we saw in the first Scholar. Okay? Um, except for the last play. Does anybody have any questions about that? No? Okay. So, all right, it's 942 now. Um, let me try and um, get us back to where we started. And then I'm going to open the floor for questions again. Okay? So, we began the session by talking about, um, by starting to look at the context of the sword in one hand section. And we noted the context as it relates to the section we just saw, which was the dagger and sword section. We noted that the last play of the section be, um, ends up being a natural follow-on from the poster that begins this uh, the section that comes after, which is this guy. So we noted there's an immediate link by poster there. Um, we started off this section by trying to at least take a cursory view as to some of the basic concepts and things we're working with here. We're looking at swords. Swords have um, swords are long. We have these things called postas. We have um, the cuts of the sword that we haven't even looked at in the book yet. They come after, but we kind of need to have them in our minds for now. And this section begins with giving us a, a guard against three anthropomorphized actions, thrusts, cuts and uh, thrown swords. The guard gives a little of foot reconstruction and without knowing what the guard does, just by understanding what the guard can do, we can predict reasonably what to expect looking at the rest of the plays. Motions and defenses in prime and also motions and defenses in breve or frontale depending on uh, what we're looking at. And sure enough, the first play we saw it was a defense in uh, Posta Longa in Prime with an entry incumbent in it after act, you know, after what isn't a simple series of actions, right? Um, we looked at the four things that happen to get us to this play. The attacker gives a, a, a basic attack. The defender reacts with a single uh, time remedy attempt to prevent himself from dying the attacker turns the edge into the single time remedy, and this action gives the defender the opportunity to immediately see, uh, continue with the tempo they have seized and enter in with an entry to the hand. That's what we saw with the first scholar, and by and large, all of the other plays in the section are going to follow from a sequence of events similar to what happened here, okay? 
Then we got to the second scholar of the of the uh, master of this sword in one hand, and we saw a play which seems alone in the whole section, that being in a canonical example of a simple uh, double time action, right? Where you make a deflection and then you make a second discrete action. And that action is, in this case, is a kill. So he, the swordsman will deflect the blow in prime, then turn his hand from prime to third position and cut down with a fendente to his enemy. So that's what we looked at so far, okay? Um, does anybody have any questions about anything we've talked about today? Comments? Was, did anybody find anything that I said confusing or something that they need, they would like more clarification on? I mean, I'm not able to see the uh, all all of the pages yet, but um, does he actually demonstrate the sword being thrown and defended against at some point? I don't believe so. Okay. I don't believe so. It's merely mentioned that he can do it. Um, I uh, uh, I confirm that he can do it. <laughs> um, I was wondering. I was just like, let me yeah. guess. You guys tried this one out. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. Actually, so one, uh, we always talked about this, but I, I, you know, we, we only did it once uh, in all the years that we were at the Ozenton location. We only did this a couple times. But a couple times, um, from what I remember, we actually took the class to a little parkette behind the school, and we had everybody try to throw their swords into the, the chain link fence. Fence post. And there actually is a bit of an art to throwing your sword, and if you know what, what to do, Kel's actually really good at it. If you know what to do, you can actually throw it extremely accurately from the uh, from the hip, and uh, and it, it can really catch somebody off guard for sure. Um, though obviously it has its disadvantages, principally being that now you have no sword. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, no, he doesn't actually show defending uh, defending the sword. Uh, a, a thrown a thrown object or a thrown spear. We have to speculate. Well, since we're probably going to be doing stuff in parks again, we should probably try that again at some point. Um, that is true. We should probably try it again. However, um, I look forward to when our liability situation is stable enough that I feel like I can get away with someone fucking this up. <laughs> <laughs> a good point. Post, a good point. post COVID, jumping into a sword throwing class to me, that's that is aggressively optimistic even for me. <laughs> 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 um, but I applaud your enthusiasm. That will get you far. <laughs> and that would be awesome, yes. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it in front of the Hyde Park cops just to piss them off. Oh, that would be that would be glorious. Uh, uh, Beanie's laughing his ass off right now. Um, okay. I do this in Guelph uh, with clubs and with uh, spears. So there's several times in the park over the summer where we would uh, take turns being in the hot seat, and everybody else would line up and throw stuff at us, and you'd step offline and beat the uh, projectile to the side. Yep, beat it off off to the side. This is actually a good a good time to ask for the scholars. Uh, Andrew and uh, uh, and Beatty, um, let's go uh, one by one. Andrew, do you have anything to add or subtract from what I've said so far tonight? No, not really. Cool, awesome. Beatty here. Um, I enjoyed the added context, Aaron, of looking at time versus temple, as well as looking at the idea of provoking to cause the openings for them the hands to come in for a disarm or for a key. That was good. I see this as a, I see a direct correlation between the sword in one hand and the sword in two hand material mm -hmm. where you have a, a <clears throat> rising true edge deflection as opposed to the sending true edge deflection for the first play mm -hmm. of two long sword in two hands. Mm -hmm. And then being able to get the thrust home if you have the line and if they 
Uh, if you provoke them to come across in the frontale, then being able to go to the other side, I see that very similar second play in the longsword. So the idea of having a position that you can defend from in a series of actions that you can either use with sensitivity in order to flow through to any one of a number of winning options, mm. uh, or if you have a weak engagement and they're a little bit, uh, <clears throat> uh, they're not as confident as they should be enforcing your will onto the fight and dominating through to, into an action. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> yeah, I see that as, mm -hmm. as very similar to the long story. And then, of course, you've got the straddle place. Yes, and so I've said the words Largo and Stretto um, actually rather liberally in this class. I didn't, I didn't actually take turns to define it. Um, I, I will save that, broadly speaking, for the Sword and Two Hands uh, session upcoming. What I will say is that very simply, when we talk about Largo and Stretto with respect to swordsmanship, we mean, um, with Largo, we mean a situation where the weapons have space to... Um, move and act in the way that they are designed. Um, you know, this is a big blade with a handle on it, right? And Largo swords um, are able to move and the blade is able to um, act freely, cut freely um, with effect. And in Stretto, uh, the uh, blade is not, right? And stretto usually involves some kind of abrazare situation, okay? Um, I should also um, make one further point. We talked a lot about principles today. We didn't actually get through that many plays, um, and um, I'm, I'm sorry for that. However, what we did do is we set ourselves up, right? This is the first time we've looked at swords really at all so far, right? And we're looking at medieval martial arts. So we can't expect just to launch into the section without taking some time to get some context, right? Um, that would be uh, rather foolish. So we've taken some time to get some context uh, to today. Brief though it was, but I, you know, I hope that this has laid the groundwork for us to start to walk through the section like we've done today, uh, knowing a bit where we're putting our feet, okay? The last thing I want to mention is this. So um, there's a problem that swordsmanship seems to present that we haven't been faced yet, uh, that, we haven't, that we haven't been faced with yet in Fury. And that is this. The only certainty that we get, the only information that has a level of certainty worth acknowledging, I mean, that's a better way of putting it. The only information that we get that has a level of certainty worth acknowledging is the information of touch. S the eye can and is deceived reliably. It is much, much, much harder to deceive your sense of touch. Much harder. And hitherto, in this martial art that we've been dealing with, we have had direct touch contact with the thing that we care about. This has enabled us thus far in every case to react based on the certainty of the information of touch where our literal hands are touching the thing in question. Now, the sword and dagger section, obviously, we started to get away from it, but um, just to make the point, okay? So, we really haven't had to really discuss too much what the alternatives to that could be, right? But in swordsmanship, the, there seems to be an available alternative, right? In swordsmanship, we seem, because we have this long weapon, we seem to be, to be presented with the opportunity to think that all of a sudden we don't need that certainty. And all of a sudden, because we have this long weapon, we can begin to rely on the eye. And we can begin to make choices about our safety and about the capabilities of the enemy, where they're going, what they're doing, and when, with the eye alone. 
Now, there are some things that you can do in this regard. That's true. And masters are definitely masters of this, right? There are many subtleties that masters can see with the eye and, and, and do. However, it's a very unreliable way to fence or to fight if one cares for their own life. The alternative is to fight with a sword in the same way that we learned how to fight thus far, that we've been seeing how the fight goes thus far. And that is to seek contact and maintain that contact whenever possible while controlling the position so that when we commit our weapon or our blow to the body of the enemy, we know with as much certainty as is possible to achieve that we are safe and we are not going to be hit by the enemy. The only way we can know that in any appreciable sense is with touch. And in swordsmanship, by and large, this entails a direct engagement of the enemy's blade. Or, of course, something like Abrazare, where we have a direct control of the enemy's uh, uh, we have we have the, the touch on the enemy's sword, their their hand, or whatever. Okay. So in the swordsmanship, we're going to be seeking engagement, not avoiding it. We're going to be we're going to be acting explicitly to get those swords crossed, to find where their sword is in time and place, and act on the information that we get. What makes swordsmanship hard is that you have to find information, correctly understand it, and act correctly following that information, all in literally the blink of an eye. And there are, there are techniques, and there are things that we can do to understand and make that less, uh, less intimidating, so, so that it is possible. But it is, um, it is an extremely difficult challenge, and this is why it takes a lifetime commitment to swordsmanship to generate any kind of mastery over it, because that's not easy, not in any way whatsoever, okay? So when we look at the plays in Fiore, the plays in Fiore are going to um, divide themselves into two main categories. Wherever we, get a, wherever we get a hit on the enemy, okay, we're gonna get the hit where we've made a defense either by structure or by tempo, okay? And we have this, these two categories shown to us very clearly in these first two plays, okay? The first is defense by structure. Defense by structure means that we can commit our sword here in this play, we can commit the point of our sword, we can plunge it through the back of their skull and we know for certain that we're safe. Because not only is our sword in contact with their sword, and will be the whole time, but our offhand is in contact with their sword hand. So we have double contact on this sword. And so if at any point during our last action, when we're committing that sword point to, the, to their skull, if at any point the position changes, such that we're no longer safe, we will know. And we can react appropriately to it. And if it doesn't change, then we don't have to change what we're doing and we can commit with confidence that sword blow to their face. And if we did that, that would be a well-earned kill. It would be perfect according to how the art goes, okay? Because we're certain of our safety and we, we hit the enemy while being certain of our safety and legitimately certain, okay? And the certainty comes from the defense. In this case, it comes from a defense by structure. In this play here, 20 VB, we have what we, we have a defense by tempo, okay? So if you look at this play, you see what's going on here, that the scholar has deflected the enemy's blade and then has cut down at the enemy 
in such a way that if the enemy's sword came back at the scholar and the scholar did not change their sword their sword position they might be hit okay if the scholar here had cut say a reversi crossing the path of where the sword would 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 uh, would come back up from if it came back up, then the scholar would be making a finishing action with the defense by structure. But in this case, the scholar is not doing that. The scholar seems to be cutting a, a fendente dritto from the right side, and he's not covering the angle that the, that, that sword might come back up from. Okay? So this might seem like a risky action. However, it's not a defense with the eyes. It's, it's not a defense by guessing. It's still a defense by touch because if the scholar knows their art and they feel the deflection, that feeling, the moment of deflection, can tell you a lot. It can tell you the velocity of their blow it can tell you the direction of the blow. It'll reveal the intent of the original act. You know, if the deflection is super slight, you know that you're probably not going to have time to go for that cut. Because the deflect, because you're going to know correctly that if the deflection was super slight, then the momentum on that sword is going to be super slight. And it could be, it'll be easy to stop and pull and change. But if the deflection is heavy, the, the momentum is therefore logically significant, and because it's the sword in one hand, it's going to be very difficult to stop. And so that moment of deflection gives you sufficient certainty to allow you to perform an action like this, where you're committing your sword to, to their body. You're not necessarily defending yourself with structure, but your defense is the temple that you've built from the action that you made. Now, prudent fencing would suggest that you can get a hit with a defense and tempo here, but then your next action ought to be to then present a defensive structure, just in case the worst were to happen and say your killing blow wasn't in fact a killing blow and the sword came back. So conventional swordsmanship would say that in a case where you have a defense uh, with measure, once you've committed their sword, your sword to their body and you've made the cut, you're then going to try to cross their sword again or um, adopt a more defensive angle, okay? Another example of a defense in measure is the leg uh, void in the uh, Largo section of the sword in two hands. So, in the Largo section here, we have um, this play here, Scholar 26RC, Folio 26RC. And in this position, we have an attack that's coming for the lead leg of a defender, the patient. And the patient has not actually sought an engagement with the sword. Rather, the patient has countercut a fendente to the enemy's head. So, in this case, the uh, because of the geometry, because of the, the natural human geometry of what we're dealing with, though the patient hasn't achieved an engagement, the patient has made a calculation of a tempo that if he voids the leg, the tempo is such that upon voiding the leg, the tempo accrues to him. Because the attacker can't possibly attack the leg and come back up on the defense at the same time. So what the, what the defender is doing here is they're voiding the leg and giving a fendente at the same time. Right? Unlike Schrodinger's cat, the sword cannot be both high and low at the same time. And so um, the calculation made by the defender here is one of tempo. But of course, if the defender were to hit the, uh, hit the attacker in this case, Regardless of whether or not it would wound him, the prudent thing to do would be then to transition to some low guard 
or Breve or to reface the sword just in case the sword were to come back up, which is, of course, a reasonable expectation. Do those two categories make sense to everybody? Defenses of structure, defenses by, me, uh, by, by tempo. Yes, I hope so. Yes, so, that makes sense. So, and the reason why I'm saying, uh, I'm giving this last bit of theory, is that we're going to see, um, we can view all of the defenses of the sword uh, through this lens as defenses with structure or defenses, um, defenses by, uh, by tempo. Um, and it's also something that we can take directly into our own fencing. Um, and you know, from, from myself, never on assessing my own fencing, um, I, uh, I really try and focus on achieving hits through defense and structure and not through um, uh, hits by getting, uh, by getting ahead in tempo. Like, um, like uh, getting, I don't know, uh, like hitting somebody just because they're, they're out of position a little bit, you know, um, when there's, their sword is free, my sword is free kind of thing, right? The solid hits are the ones that, you know, you, know, you, go, you, you make an action, it, it, it makes them follow, and then, you make, and then you're ahead, and you make them follow again, and they follow again, and then you hit them, and your swords are bound, and you're totally safe, and you control the whole way in, and it's perfect, right? That's the, that's the applause-worthy kind of swordsmanship that I think we all aspire to. And not only that, but that's the kind of swordsmanship which I think, anyway, one would aspire to if these swords were actually sharp. And if your whole life and everything that you cared about was on the line with every engagement. Uh, all right. So um, I think that pretty much um, sums up today. Um, I, I knew it was going to go fast. Um, we didn't get very far per se, but we dealt with a lot of big concepts. Um, I hope I addressed them with some clarity. Um, I hope I kind of laid the groundwork for looking at the rest of the section. Next class, we will dive right in to um, these plays. I'm sure we'll finish the section no problem, not least because most of them are analogs. Uh, most of the plays that follow are analogs of the first scholar here. And then uh, we'll move on to the sword and two hand section. Uh, the sword and two hand section has a lot of um, theory in, incumbent in the posters. So we're, uh, if any of you are still a little hazy on the theory or on some of the, these basic concepts, we will uh, get back to it. Okay? Um, if nobody has any further questions, then thank you guys very, very much again for coming. And I uh, hope you guys are safe and um, healthy, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Aaron. Bye. Thank you, Aaron. Thank everybody. <laughs>